Okay, am I on? I'm on, it sounds like. Those are some great questions you had as you guys came up during the break. We have half the crowd we had before, so I've either scared half of you away, or bored you, or still coming back from break. So this is a good thing. We stopped short about uh, two concepts, about ten slides short on that last presentation. This next hour is going to be a full hour at least. So um, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, I'm going to ask how many of you want to continue with the last two concepts. Well, let me see if it's even worth it to do that, to be honest. Oh, is my screen not on? Thank you. All the way on the right. Go, go. One over. Almost. You got it. All right. <laughs> So a quick discussion about grids um, and one about diagonal balance. Um, we can cover those quickly, actually. Let's do that. We'll breeze through those and then dive into session number three. Using grids, um, I love this quote by Mark Bolton. The grid is a regulatory system which preempts the basic formal decisions in the design process. Its preconditions help in the structuring division and ordering of content. This is a brief review of what CRIDs are and, and how, they, how to use them, GRIDs that is. These are in the slides, so I won't take time to work through that, but I do encourage you to establish a GRID system for your site if you haven't done so already, because again, it facilitates putting content in certain places and, and alleviates some of the decisions you have to make. Here's the New York Times, for example, which uses an 11, qual they're, they're equal qual columns, um, an 11 column GRID that looks like this. You have two spatial zones, or three that is, the gray and teal and green areas uh, that are used for content. And then you have um, within those spatial zones, even smaller spatial zones within that main photo down in the lower right, you've got the, the Bob Herbert section, et cetera, et cetera. I'll typically code my sites with a grid of some sort by actually embedding the grid temporarily into the background of the page for whatever elements that I need a grid for. And that's typically the entire body, or at least the container divs for the entire body. That's as simple as putting in um, just a couple lines of code up in the, in the, in the uh, head tag and commenting that out as needed. Here you see it without grids. Uh, let's make it fast forward a bit. As soon as I turn that text or turn that uh, code on, it will then produce a grid in the background that I can work with and align my elements to that grid. This works well if you're doing a fixed layout, right? It doesn't always work so well with a flexible layout, um, although you can do the same because even with a flexible layout, you've got to design that thing at some starting point. And for me, when I'm designing for 1024, that usually turns out to be 960 pixels as that starting point, whether it is flexible or fixed. And that's what I did with the intranet I showed you earlier. It expands and collapses, but inevitably needed to be designed at at least one fixed resolution before it would do those things. And for me, that resolution is 960 to, um, pixels. How many of you have started designing with 1024 as the base resolution? How many are still doing 800 by 600? Yeah, we're kind of, it's about half and half, isn't it? We're kind of at that transition right now, going from 800 to, by 600 to 1024 by whatever. I've found as I've designed the number of sites for 1024 optimized as, as that base and moving forward or moving up, um, that 960 pixels tends to be the right width for my layout, especially if it's a fixed width layout. And there are a number of reasons for that, one being it allows browser Chrome as well as those, a lot of people don't browse, of course, with full screen uh, windows, and so it allows them to shrink that window down perhaps to where they're comfortable and still have the site fit within that area. But perhaps even more importantly, related to grids, 960 is divisible by an insane number of uh, amounts. It's divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 16, 20, 24, um, 30, 120, 240, et cetera, et cetera. And so what it allows me to do is to split up that layout of 960 pixels into a ton of columns and gutters. That may be 3, might be 16. And those divisions often align with IEB banner width. So if I have banner advertisements on my site, some of those divisions, such as 120, 160, and 240, align nicely with some of the banner ad sizes that are being used on most of the larger websites. 
This grid is available uh, through my site. Um, this is a grid I set up that is a 960 pixel width grid with divisions from half all the way up to eight being divided by color here into the grid. So as I will design a layout, I'll often drop this into the background, see how my elements are being aligned with that background. And I'm running on reserve power. Let's plug this in. And then as I'm coding, I'm able to see how my elements align, or my columns align with the page. And you can see how many different ways you can cut this up. Finally, just a quick point on diagonal balance. If you're ever designing forms, which I'm sure 99% of you are doing quite often, use diagonal balance. This is from Jennifer Tidwell, a great book. I recommend it called Designing Interfaces. And it just covers a, a variety of patterns and principles for UI design. And here she says, besides being nicer to look at, a diagonal balance also sets up the page so that the user's eye moves easily from the top left to the bottom right, an ideal visual flow for users who speak left to right languages. Here's an example of that with PayPal or eBay. As I check out, when I go to check out, this is what the screen looks like. And my eye does roughly this. I look, yep, that's my address. OK, that's the item I'm ordering. That looks like the right total. And then I have to go all the way back over to see the continue button. What would be an easy fix if we were trying to make this be diagonally balanced? Yeah, we just move that over, don't we? Boom, you're done. Now my f the flow can go from top left to bottom right as I go through that form. All right, let's go open slide number three and get into some of the more advanced techniques. These might be mixed around again as well, and I apologize, but again, you can get these slides in their entirety as you see them in this presentation. Here we go. So I tried contacting Pete LePage, who works at Microsoft, to get updated stats on penetration of IE7. I got an email from him about an hour ago. Um, he may have replied by now. I don't know what the stat is, though. I was going to try to present an updated stat. Has anyone heard what penetration, IE7 penetration, is up to nowadays? So last time I gave this six months ago, it was 19%. I'm quite certain it's much higher than that now. I don't know what the actual percentage is. Good thing is, however, is we can start taking advantage of some of these CSS2 and even CSS3 properties that are now supported by IE7 that weren't before, specifically child selectors, adjacent selectors, and so on. Of course, we can't rush and, and take advantage of them right now without analyzing where our audience is at and, and just what the install rate is within that audience. So for example, at our organization, IE7 penetration is actually very low because any software that makes it onto the desktop has to be approved um, at, the, at the top levels. And that happened, hasn't happened for IE7 yet. So we really can't take advantage of this yet. But we're starting to understand how we can prepare to take advantage of IE7 as soon as it is approved for um, the organization, at least in terms of the internet, and all of them using IE7 or, or what have you. If we talk, um, before we get into IE7, let's talk about bulletproofing something, because this will lay the, the foundation for some of the, the code techniques that we'll see here over the next half hour. How many of you read Dan Cederholm's Bulletproof Web Design book? Yeah, great book. If you haven't read that book, rush out and get it. Because if you're dealing with an application or a website that needs to be translated into other languages, that is handed off to development or content people and has all kinds of content thrown at it that you couldn't anticipate, um, or needs to endure the rigors of rebranding for clients. In other words, you have an application that you license to other people and it has to be rebranded with their look and feel and so on. If you deal with any of those things, then you need to understand the, the, the concepts behind bulletproof web design. How to make something as flexible as possible with using minimal um, images and what have you as possible. Let me describe this concept. I was on a plane a little while ago visiting a client. Uh, I don't remember where this was. Uh, of course, it didn't look like this plane, but uh, well, I go to back to the bathroom, and I see this sign in the bathroom, and I'm like, oh, man, I've got to get my camera, run back to my seat, and run back to the bathroom, and start taking a picture there. And the, you can imagine if a flight attendant had come in and seen me taking a picture over in the bathroom and what they might have done. 
But on this sign it said, no stowage. And then beneath that, translated in Spanish, it said this. Seven words to say the same two words in English. Imagine if this were a button or something within your interface, and this was subjected to translation, and your button, which was nicely aligned in a certain area of the interface that happened to be 50 pixels wide, now suddenly has to be 150, 170 pixels wide. What do you do in those situations? Well, bulletproof design is all about that. It's about allowing for font resizing. Um, or text resizing, allowing for flexibility in sectional areas that might be a sidebar box or a promo area or something like that that needs to be flexible and endure the rigors of translation or have new content thrown at it. This is an example. What was that last one? Did I miss it? Oh, and localization, of course. Dan Cederholm designed this site as well, and it's very bulletproof. It's almost impossible to break this site. When I say break, I mean text flowing outside of their containing elements, um, and what have you. So if I take this same site for microformats and I send that site uh, or I subject it to text resizing, this is what happens. So as I resize the text, notice how the sidebar elements can be resized up and down and virtually retain their size, even with having rounded corners and everything else. Look at, let's replay that. See beneath the, each post it says September 19th, it says Francis, one comment. Watch what happens with those boxes as well as they are resized. All of them retain their proper shape. And even the nav items, blog, wiki, code, discuss about at top, also retain their styling as they have these rounded boxes containing them. And if we then take it, and I did this just on the front end. I didn't have Dan do this. I just sent it through Google, the Google Translate feature, and had it spit out simple Chinese characters. And yet again, look how it renders perfectly with nothing broken. So here we can resize the text, we can throw different languages at it, and everything on this side, the buttons, the sidebar, and anything else, retains its visual integrity. Well, if we look at rounded buttons, I think rounded corners are, are ubiquitous nowadays, and it's not my intent to talk about how to do rounded corners, but if we look at the, the challenge of doing something with rounded corners at, as a bulletproof element, it then becomes really complex to do that, and that's why we're going to use a, an element that has rounded corners to demonstrate how bulletproofing can be done with something as complex as a button with rounded corners and a background image and what have you. There are a number of ways to do this, of course. We can look at uh, you know, Spiffy Box, uh, Nifty Corners Cube. Most of these use JavaScript where they actually render the corners as, as rounded uh, elements. We want to do that without JavaScript, though. We want to skip all that and just use CSS, good old CSS and HTML, to produce a button that can be flexible. Here's one from Roger, Roger Johansson. Um, this will do largely the same as I'm going to show you. And that is this. If we go back and look at this button inside of the browser. So again, the intent of this button is one, that it uses no JavaScript. Two, that it can be resized both um, horizontal and vertical. What I mean by that is this. So as I resize this button, notice how the button maintains its integrity. Our little image over here doesn't retain its size. That's a pixel-based image. We could probably do that using M's, and had we made that large enough, have that resized as well. But notice as I resize the text, my button maintains um, its style. If we pull up Firebug again, and we go in and edit this button, we can say a really long comment. And notice how our button retains, um, again, its visual integrity. So you can imagine something being thrown in here. Now, at some point, some, some translation text being thrown in here, at some point, it's going to break, right? Oh, that's pretty good, actually. I didn't know I could put that much text in there. There we go. So at this point, my button's now breaking. I could have gotten around that by making the button even wider, but I figured in this case, well, most, in most cases, this button's only going to be this wide, so I'll put this, this much text in and have it function and display properly for that. So imagine this button being an in, in interface and being sent to translation, being translated in, in 12 different languages, all those uh, languages having those three words, add a comment, being either shorter or longer than the original English meaning. If we look at how this is done, let's go back to the presentation. 
Unfortunately, the code is a bit clunkier than I'd prefer. There is no way right now without CSS3, which we're going to look at here in a minute, there's no way to do this without adding in at least two extra unnecessary elements that really have no semantic meaning otherwise. And here's how it works. We have four elements at play here. And these four elements each contain an image in their corner. We have a div, a wrapper div, another wrapper div inside of that, the anchor tag, and then the emphasis tag. So really what's in blue is the necessary semantic markup. We could argue that all of that is relevant and should be there. It's the two outside of that, the button inner and button wrappers, uh, that start to introduce really some superfluous code on top of that. But again, there's really no other way to do this right now without having to resort to at least two extra elements on top of that, or JavaScript. The way this works is you have just two images that produce this button. The actual size of the button is there at top, and beneath you see the two images as being much larger than the button itself. One is 180 pixels tall um, and quite wide, and the other is just a cap that sits on the end. Those four elements, the two wrapper divs, the anchor tag, and the emphasis tag, all use just those two images to produce the effect uh, that we're creating here. There's the markup, and again, let's dive into that. So we have two wrapper divs on the outside. We have button, and then inside of that, we have button inner. Well, both of those are using those two images you just saw at the top left and the top right. So button, the first one being up at the top right, button inner being at the top left. So here we're starting to create the two portions of this button by using the upper left and right corners. We're then going to create the bottom two portions of this button by using the anchor tag and the emphasis tag. So that will position the same two images. It will repeat them. And um, that will position them at the lower left and lower right of that single button. You notice that we're adding uh, some padding here. We're displaying those two elements as block level elements to be able to produce a button with no hitless areas. That is to say that not just the text is going to be clickable, but the entire button is going to be clickable as well. And here are those two pieces on the bottom too. If we, bring, if we look at that code again, we, we bring those two images in, we now see, okay, the two wrapper images are using the top left and the top right, the anchor tag and the emphasis using the bottom left and the bottom right, and there is what our uh, image turns out to be. So we can either stretch this thing width-wise, we can stretch it height-wise, and when we turn off um, the styles and images, we then see just the add a comment link being there as text only. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Let's talk about CSS3. Since it's coming out in 2012, we want to prepare now and make sure we're, <laughs> we're prepared, <laughs> prepared well in advance. Well, we don't know when CSS3, or at least all of it, is going to be released, but they've at least restarted releasing parts of it in some of the browsers. And so we can at least start anticipating, okay, so how would we do this with CSS3? How can we take advantage of a CSS3 property to do the same thing? Fortunately, there are three different properties that allow us to do the same technique with no extra markup, which is really cool. And some of the browsers are just starting to support these techniques. So it shouldn't be long, hopefully, before we see maybe IE7, I, I doubt it, but at some point seeing these, these properties supported enough to, to where we can use them. This is the box I'm going to show you quickly here. I'm not going to go into the details of how this was constructed. I'll just show you the three properties in CSS3 that you can take advantage of, hopefully soon. Let me go pull up some code to show you what the, this looks like. So this is pretty straightforward. In fact, should we go, let's do that. Okay, so we have, you can see we've got three boxes. One is going to use the multiple background images property. The next one is going to use the border radius, and the last one, border images. And those three look like this. Multiple backgrounds currently is supported only by Safari. I promise you when all of the major browsers support this feature, you will just go absolutely wild with your designs. This is the one CSS3 feature that we need supported right now. There's been, I can't think of a single website where I haven't wanted to use more than one image in a single element. It just bugs me to know in that we can't take advantage of this. And that's precisely what it does. It says, okay, 
let's say one element could have not just one background image, but up to four. That's actually eight. Isn't it eight? Can anyone confirm that? I thought I'd read that it's up to eight images that can be used in one element. Here we're using just four. We're saying, okay, let's take our background images. I'm just going to do a top left corner, a top right, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to not repeat those images, and then I'll just say, okay, the first one, this one's going to be a line top left, much like you do margin padding where you do one pixel, 10 pixel, five pixel, and so on. We're saying the same thing here. This next one's going to be a line top right, and so on. Unfortunately, that one's not supported yet by anything other than Safari. So we pulled this up in Safari, you'd see this rounded box. The second option is border radius. So we can actually have the browser draw a radius around the borders, no images at all. We can just say, okay, border radius of 1.5m, or pixels for that matter, and just have the browser draw a radius equal to that on the corners. How nice would that be? And then finally, this is, that's supported, by the way, only by Firefox and Safari 3. And you see that functioning here inside of Firefox, although it's supported by using the Moz border radius uh, property somewhat temporarily. This is the, the accepted one. Finally, the last one, this is not supported by any major browser yet, um, but it's in the, the spec for CSS3, and that is using the borders themselves to include images. So you can actually take a border and not just put a stroke to it, but an actual image inside of that border and just aligning it up on the, on the side. This is kind of bizarre if you ask me. I don't know why they're doing that. These other two seem much more feasible and applicable. All right, so CSS3. Okay, we saw how we might be able to do that with CSS3. Let's look at another technique that we might be able to use here with CSS3. So we're going till, till what time? Till 3, till 4.15? Is that right? Okay. Am I going too fast? Raise your hand if I'm going too fast. Too slow? Putting you to sleep? <laughs> too much code? Not enough code? All right, well, we've got a couple more code examples that we'll work through, and then we'll wrap up with my portfolio, which is a good spattering of communication and design and code, and then we'll talk about mobile devices for those who want to stick around for the last few minutes. Let's look at another bulletproof example. So this was a design I did about two years ago, I think it was, uh, just for a furniture retailer down in San Francisco. And I wanted the navigation to be a bit unconventional, but at the same time usable and bulletproof. And you can see up at the top there, you've got, oh, I can't move my mouse, but you can see the home, the product, services, about contact links being layered on top of each other. And as you go through the site, that will stay there, and, and you get deeper into the side and see different levels of category, presentation, what have you. Now, with, the, uh, with this menu, it's bulletproof in two ways. One, you can resize it up and down. Um, and I guess it's not technically bulletproof, but I can turn off the styles and have it display properly for someone. There you see a space between services and about. Ignore that, and I'll show you why here in a second. Here's what the menu looks like. I asked the question at the onset of this, how can I do this with one menu, have two layers um, of, of navigation, but with one menu? And what would that look like to a visual user and to a, a disabled user? Well, it's a straightforward, unordered list. At least it starts out like that. We then just remove the style on the list. So we remove the disk from the list, uh, do a couple other things to it. Uh, to the list items, we display those as blocks, float them left, and then the anchor tags we also display as blocks and assign a width of 7.8 m's, and that's going to assign each of those navigation items to have the same width. And then we put a border um, to the left of those items. So, okay, that's pretty straightforward. This is what it ends up like so far. That's looking kind of good, and that looks like a standard uh, navigation menu. Well, to get it to stack on top of each other, two things have to be done. One, we add a class to the first three to allow a border onto the bottom. So we had the first, uh, those first three list items. We're saying class equals alt. And with that, we're going to say, OK, uh, down on the bottom there, border bottom. So for those th first three items, we're going to assign a border to that uh, so that it shows a division between the top and the bottom rows. Now, the other trick here, which is not terribly complex, is just assigning the entire navigation list a, a certain width of 28, in this case, 28 m's. We, we know that only three items could fit within that, and because we're floating those items, they're now going to wrap to the individual rows once you hit that width 
uh, specification of 28 M's. And so here we go. Here is the visual presentation of that menu alongside uh, what the markup spits out as. Now the question then becomes, could we do that same thing with CSS3? Maybe in 2016 we can, because this one's probably going to be even further out than multiple backgrounds. But let me just show you, just for the fun of it, what this looks like. There is something that will be coming at some point in CSS3 called the Advanced Layout Module. This is really cryptic because it almost takes us back to the days of ASCII art. You almost draw ASCII art with your CSS to produce and simulate a layout. This is what it looks like. So if we were to do that same menu where we had two rows, we would say, OK, here is the navigation menu. We're going to say display model is the property. And then the value, this is really tricky, the values then become how that table, or I guess that data, is laid out. Each string, in quotes, is a row. Is this making any sense? So that first string, you're saying A, B, C. That is row, cell. That's, that's a first row, and you have cell A, cell B, cell C. And then you do a line break and put in quotes the second row. And you do D, E, F as being the second row of cells. So you're literally drawing ASCII art in some respects here. Let me show you what this looks like. Unfortunately, none of the browsers, I can't imagine why, support this yet. What's that? How do you know it works? How do I know it works? Because I've heard <laughs> legends of it working. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've read a number of tutorials on this about how it's supposed to be done, but whether or not it actually renders that way is fascinating to me. Here's what it looks like. You actually do, it won't spit out this ASCII art, but that's essentially what you're drawing by saying A, B, C on one line and D, E, F. You're essentially drawing an ASCII art table structure for that menu. Isn't that kind of bizarre? I don't know if that'll ever be supported. Go ahead. Is that part of the definition of a CSS ninja doing things that aren't <laughs> A CSS ninja doing things that aren't supported yet, but will be 10 years from now? It could be. Um, I, I demonstrate that more than anything, just to see what's coming and, and to see other ways of, of doing things. Go ahead. Are they building this in to kill tables? That's a great question. I don't know, because you still have to have markup on the front end, right? And tables, the nice advantage of tables is that it, it spits out markup that can be rendered by, you name it, screen readers, mobile devices, and what have you. On this end, you still have to have some markup on the front end, whether it be a list item, or a div, or a paragraph, or something, that you're then just converting with CSS to make a layout. Does that kind of answer your question? I don't know if it would totally negate tables. That's a good question. Other questions? Go ahead. I'm using M's everywhere. Like where? Remind me, I'm forgetting what code I've presented. Oh, with the widths. Yeah, so the reason, OK, so your question is, why are you using M's? Isn't that for print? That's a great question. Does someone want to answer that? I can provide my answer, but would someone like to answer that in my place? Go ahead. Okay, did you hear what he said? He said, if, get me, correct me if I'm wrong, but he essentially said, um, by using M's, you allow your layout to be flexible as things are resized. Is that kind of what you're saying? Okay, so let's go back to that menu. I'll just briefly show you in mine. I'm using M's on the widths, and I think that's what you're asking about. Oh, gosh, where are you? There we go. So I'm using width 7.8 m's. Now, had I not done that, when I resize the text, or someone has their default size, font size, set to something other than whatever the standard is, what's going to happen as I have these three items floated next to each other, if I set each of those to be, say, 40 pixels, well, as that text becomes larger than the default size I had built, what's going to happen is the text from the first one will overlay into the second one, and then the second one into the third one, and so on. And so as that text is larger than what my default is, 
as either someone resizes the, the, the text on their own or their default is set to something else, it's going to overlap those items. But because the widths are set as M's, that's a relative measurement. So if their font size is larger, then it bases it off of that. And now my menu items can expand as the text gets larger. Go ahead. Why wouldn't you use percentages instead of M's? You probably could. I would have had to set the, the UL the, to the list to 100%, perhaps, and, and set each of those to be 33% or something like that. That's another option. Did you have a comment? question, do I use small, medium, large for font sizes? Not usually. I'm using M's, typically setting a, a base font size up in the, up in the body. I guess so, yeah. I, I've never really used small, medium, large, and so on very much at all in any of my designs, and probably just preference. All right, other questions? Go ahead. So I'm padding everything with pixels. You know what? I like these questions, and I think our next section is, is um, recommendations for, let me see, let's see what it is here, hang on. Oh, by the way, if you missed the website address, this is where you can get the updated slides and code examples. You know what, I'm going to hold off on your question. You, you asked, I'm using PX for, for padding, why am I doing that, right? I'm going to come back to that. That will get back into best practices for CSS, and we'll talk about that. Go ahead. Yeah. To the text. Yeah, great comment. So the comment being, M's are related to text. If you're going to have text, something being dependent on the flexibility of the size of that text, it's a wise idea to use M's. Great comment. Go ahead. If I use pixels for padding, what happens between IE and Firefox? There, there might be. <laughs> that might be a, a long question answer. Is it okay if I hold off on that one and perhaps come back at, to the end? That could be a detailed answer. <laughs> Let's move on to selectors for a minute. So here we're going to talk about taking advantage of some of these selectors that are now supported in IE 7, as soon as our audience has a large enough install base to use them, which may be now it may be down the road. For some of us in the room, it might be four or five years. Some of you I talked to said it's not going to happen for a while. Just a, a brief review. I often get confused with these terms, so I'm going to provide a review for all of us. When we talk about HTML, we talk about three things. We talk about elements, attributes, and values. When we talk about CSS, we talk about selectors, properties, and values. And I'm clarifying that now because I'm going to dive into some of this and I want to make sure we're using the right terms. Correct me if I use the incorrect ones. Selectors come in all flavors and sizes and here are just a few of them. There's the universal selector which selects all elements on the page by using the asterisk. You've seen that. The type selector which selects every instance of a given element such as an M, a P, a div, etc, etc. A class or ID selector which selects instances with specified classes or ID attributes. And then the latter three start to get a bit more technical. The descendant selector. Well, this selects all elements that are descendants of another element. I think this is the one that we probably use most collectively within this room, I'd guess that. And then the child selector and adjacent selector are two that we've not been able to use before because IE6 doesn't really support them at least with not any tricks or techniques that forces IE6 to support them. A child selector is simply this. It selects all direct children of a parent element, and it will not select all descendants, like the descendant selector, but only direct children. That is to say, if you have a div with the selector ID of title, and you use the greater than symbol, to target any M tag inside of there, it will target only those that are direct children of the title div, whether or not it immediately follows that. You'll see that here in a minute. I'm probably going to confuse you, but I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. Do you have a comment, question in the back? What's the difference between using that and nesting? Nesting elements? Yeah. What's the, what, what would be the difference between using that child selector and saying, uh, 
Just nesting stuff down. Well, I'm going to show you a few examples that I think will answer that question. Uh, an adjacent selector, so this one selects any sibling immediately following an element. So for example, H2, H2 plus P will target any paragraph immediately following an H2. That's a bit confusing. You're going to see some examples here in a second that, that hopefully clarify this. And then finally, the greater than, the plus, and the space are what are called combinators. So if you hear something like adjacent combinators, that's just a technical term to describe the plus symbol that's probably being used in that case. So with the 7, with IE7, we now have access to a bevy of CSS2 and CSS3 properties that were not previously supported by IE6. Here are just a few of them. Min-max width, min-max height, child selectors, adjacent selectors, attribute selectors, the first, it actually shouldn't be first child, but first anything, first line, first child, first letter. And the alpha channel, yes, finally, right? The alpha channel in ping images. It's about time that this is supported. Here's the example that we're going to look at. We're going to take just one chunk of very simple code with a couple nested elements inside of it to show how using a descendant, a child, and adjacent selector can target each of those lines. Let me give you an overview through Keynote here, the presentation, and then we're going to dive into the actual code itself um, in just a couple minutes. For all three of these examples, we're going to use the first line pseudo class. The first line pseudo class is not what I'm trying to demonstrate here. It's just being used to show that you can make, within a given paragraph or any text element for that matter, whatever the first line is, you can treat that line and do whatever you want with it. You can transform the text to be uppercase. You can have the text be red. You can have it be bold, and so on. Here, I'm just using the first line pseudo class to demonstrate the difference between the three here, but that's not really tied into the selectors themselves. I know that's a bit confusing, but I think you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. If we use just the descendant selector uh, for this first example, this is what we're all accustomed to using. And that is, we say, OK, for the, the div with an ID of content, P colon first line, that means, OK, find any paragraph, any descendant within the div, the wrapper div of content, and convert that first line to be uppercase. So in this case, on the right, to the right of that image, any of the code in white is going to be converted to be an uppercase first line. And so we see in red in the diagram every single paragraph's first line being uppercase. A child selector. Well, unlike the previous example, a child selector will not select any, uh, or excuse me, all descendants, but only those that are direct children. Now, what I've done here is on purpose, if you look at the code to the right of the image, the diagram up there, I have on purpose put two paragraphs embedded inside of a div beneath the content wrapper div, on purpose, to show that, hey, with the child selector, it selects only those that are direct children, not grandchildren. And so we see in our diagram at left only the first two paragraphs, because those are direct children, and the next two paragraphs are not being affected by this text transform uppercase. And then finally, oh no, not finally. So here's typically how we've done it before. We've said, OK, I've got a paragraph that's a couple levels down, it's nested. I need to target that one paragraph, that one div, that one list item, whatever. And I need to do something special to just that item. How do I do it? Well, typically, what do we do? We're relegated to a bunch of classes that we throw into the markup. And in this case, I'm, I'm doing this in the typical way. I'm saying, OK, class equals intro, because I want to target that one paragraph that says, as a side note, Mr. Roundy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, typically, I have to use nothing but a class. And so you have all these classes in there that you then target with specific CSS properties and values. Our adjacent, if we combine both the child and the adjacent selector together, we can then finally target that item with just a single line of code, actually two lines of code, and not having to put classes everywhere in our markup. So in this case, I want to target that same one paragraph as a side note, Mr. Roundy. And I have to do two things to be able to do that. First line, I've got my child selector selecting only direct children of the second div. So I'm saying content div, um, that first greater than paragraph. And the second line in green there, in this case, all the P's would then be selected. So we use the adjacent selector 
to effectively turn off uppercase styling for all paragraphs that follow. This is really confusing, isn't it? Let's dive into the code, and I think this will clear things up for you. I even get confused sometimes when I try to explain this. It's best often to just pull up the code and, and to see how it's used. While I'm doing that, what are the implications of being able to, to do something like this? Why would we even be talking about doing something like this? Well, it becomes quite useful when you start looking at forms and, and other elements that before you had to put all kinds of classes in there. So right now, when you want to target a certain input field in a form, what do you have to do? You have to add a class to it, right? There's no other way because they're all the same type and, and then the submit button is targeted as well and so on. One of the things that I'm not showing here but that we can now start using if our user base has IE7 to a large enough percent is an attribute selector to select text or type equals submit or type equals input or things like that and just target those fields and not every field in the form, which we haven't been able to do um, up until now. So if we go back to our code, this is going to be a tricky bounce back and forth between Firefox and, and, um, and uh, my text editor. You can do this inside of Firebug, but it's really tricky. So I'm just going to do it inside of here for sake of simplicity. Let's look at our first item. If we take these comment tags out and we look at this item, we're now saying, okay, this is a typical descendant selector, right? I'm selecting any paragraph and I'm doing a first line uh, tweaking to it. And so now we see every single line in here has been uppercased. There we go. Let's go back to the code then. Turn that off and so say, okay, what if we did a child selector? What if we wanted to select only those that are direct children of the content div and that would be which ones it would be this one and it would be this one because these are typically are, are classified as grandchildren so if we save that and refresh it we now see these first two paragraphs being targeted whereas the latter two are not and then finally we're not finally yet but if we go back to our class selector we would then have to add in we'd say before before child and adjacent selectors were supported I had to go in and every time I wanted to target a specific element, I had to add in class equals intro or something like that, right? So here I'm saying, okay, I want to target just that paragraph and unfortunately I have to add a class to it and I might do that 100 times within my application. Okay, great, now I can target that. Well, what if I want to target that without having to introduce any unnecessary classes or IDs, any unnecessary markup, period? Well, we would then use the child and adjacent selectors in combination. If we use only this first one, we are saying, okay, we're going to turn on the latter two down here. Those are the two that we're targeting. Those are the only two that we want to target. Because we're saying, okay, inside of content wrapper, find the div that sits inside of there, which is this one and then target only those paragraphs that are direct children. So we see this paragraph and this paragraph is now receiving a treatment of text transform uppercase. Well, that's good, but again, we want to target just this one paragraph. How do we do that? Well, now we introduce into the equation our adjacent selector, and that is saying find those same paragraphs. So we go down from wrapper to div to now any paragraph in there and find this plus this combinator saying find any paragraph that immediately follows another paragraph and for those paragraphs do nothing. So we're essentially turning the styling off, right? So now if we save this and we did everything right, there we go, we targeted just that one paragraph which is a couple lines of code. So now we could actually go in here and put as many lines of code as we wanted. We might have, you know, 30 paragraphs in here and notice how none of those are going to be targeted because of that single line of adjacent selector code targeting anything that has a paragraph following another paragraph. Ooh, does that make sense? Okay, question here and a question here. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's not perfect, right? We'd probably have to go in and write one more line of code that might have a heading or an image element or something else that we expect to be in there. 
That's true, right? Maybe you want to first line anything that follows a heading, and just that one line of code would facilitate that. You're right. So if you wanted to do that, the code's already set up to be able to do that. Question in the front. Well, it, that one will just become the relative paragraph to be targeted. I think if I understand your question is, is, is the child and adjacent selector combinations target any of the paragraphs that follow, right? But what if you wanted to, what would happen if you put a paragraph before that? Is that what you're asking? Well, let's say we can somehow still target as a side paragraph. Mm-hmm. Within the adjacent selector, would that target anything on the same level? Or just everything following? Everything following, right. So anything preceding would not? I think so. I think I understand your question. And that is, so what if we wanted to target the second paragraph and not the first and leave the first and third and fourth and everything else unaffected? How would we do that? I think that question came up when I did this in Boston last December, and we actually did it in the presentation. It took us about 15 minutes to work through that. I don't know that we'll repeat it here, but we actually got a working solution where we went through the code and did a couple scenarios that I had not planned on showing. It's possible to do it, but I think for the sake of not belaboring this point even further, um, we might skip that exercise. Does that work? OK, any other questions, comments? For some of you, you're like, yes, this is great. And the rest of you are like, dude, this is getting old fast, Cameron. Move on to something other than code. <laughs> it's so hard to, to, to cater to 200 people and to understand where they're at, their, their love of code or hatred of it and their love of design and, or hatred of design and, and to, to try to produce examples and so on that cater to uh, the two audiences. All right, we've got about, if I'm guessing right, no, we have 15 minutes left. We need to leave our, our round, or excuse me, stop at 4.15. We've got a couple quick items I'm going to wrap up with. Um, and then before we break, there were a few, people that, a few people that came and spoke with me during the break that I want to bring up um, the comments that they had, had mentioned. Let's go back into the presentation. So if we look at common mistakes being made in CSS, I'm actually surprised at how common these mistakes still are because some of them are pretty basic. So if you're still making these mistakes, don't feel bad. I think we're all still learning. Um, I still make the same mistakes sometimes myself. And again, they're pretty basic probably for most of you. But for those of you uh, who haven't been as exposed to CSS, this might be a good um, overview. And here are just a few simple co mistakes that are made quite often. Number one, uncondensed codes. So those first three lines, border width, one pixel, border style solid, and border color can all be condensed down into one single line there on the bottom. The more effective example, using shortcuts, border, one pixel solid, zero, zero, zero. The same as you doing padding left, padding right, padding top. You can condense all those into padding, one pixel, two pixel, three pixel, et cetera. Redundant values, background, URL image dot gif, top left, repeat. The problem here is top left and repeat are all inherent values in the background property, meaning that property is going to position the, the background image at the top left and repeat it, even if you don't put those values in there. So here we can eliminate these unnecessary values of top left and repeat by just saying on the bottom, background URL image dot gift. Presentational selector names. We made the biggest mistake about four years ago, maybe three years ago, I think it was four years ago when we first started using CSS at a company where we had an application that we would then take and rebrand for other companies. And we'd essentially paint it with their skin and their logo and things like that. So everywhere in the application, there must have been like 500 templates for this application, we used these, what we thought at the time were these fantastic class and ID names of red for the color and 14 for the font size. And so out of the application, we had P class equals red 14, and, and div equals blue uh, 12. And we thought this was great, because all you had to do was remember red, blue 12, and stuff like that, and type it in. Well, what happened was as soon as a client came along whose colors were brown and green, guess what happened? That whole naming structure just went out the window, because now blue and red and everything else was green and brown. We had to go back and rewrite all of the class and ID names to be non-presentational selector names. So if we're doing something like incorrect username, we don't want to say class equals red bold, because what happens when that color needs to be 
orange and italic or something like that. Instead, we say class equals air, a much more semantic uh, name, uh, a non-presentational name, that is. And we say incorrect username, and then we style the error message however we need to. OK, so this opens up a huge can of worms that I don't want to get into. We can talk about this after the presentation. To pixel or not to pixel is the question that we're now facing with IE7. And there's been considerable debate about whether or not we can go back to using pixels as we did before, whether we should continue using M's or other relative font sizing um, techniques. I kind of say it this way. You know what? Using pixels, I'm going to ignore the whole discussion about whether or not to use pixels for fonts. And I'm going to say, you know what? Using pixels for everything is often a mistake. Because conversely, using M or percentages for everything is also a mistake. Why is that? Well, if you have something in this example, margin right equals 3M, as we talked about earlier, that M sizing is relative to the font sizing. So let's say we have that. We have a, a, an element that has a paragraph in it. And we've said, OK, we need 3Ms of space between that. Or we need the equivalent of, say, 30 pixels. And we say, hey, it'd be great to just use Ms or percentages. Well, as soon as that text resizes, so does that spacing element. So now 3Ms has become, relatively speaking, 10 or 12Ms, which means for someone whose default size might be set to large or something else like that, that element now, because we used Relative sizing is now pushed way off the page. When we could have said, all we need is just 30 pixels of padding around that element, no matter how big or small the text is, then we say, OK, it's fine to use pixels there. Because as the text resizes, we still just need a little space around the border of that image or something, whatever that element might be. Divitis, span-itis, break-itis. Again, with selectors, we're trying to, among many other things, reduce the number of classes and IDs that we have to throw into our code. Here we have uh, you know, an example where you have a concert event, and you're saying, when is it coming up? And you have a nice break, break tag. You remember the days of this? Some of us might still be doing this. I did this all the time myself. Um, you have a link item with a span around the map. How do we clean that up? How do we make that a bit more um, semantic? Well, we might say, OK, that's, that's a concert item. We're going to give that a heading. Instead of saying div ID equals header, and then div class equals highlight, we can do all that with the h2 tag, right? We can just set those styles inside of the CSS. And then we might have when and where and who and all of those things. So we say, OK, what if we used a definition list to separate those items out? We don't have to use a table. We could use a definition list to break them apart. And all we have to do is wrap the when and the where and the why in a, a, a DT, and then the date or the location or things like that inside of um, the DD. And then with the, the map, we know that's going to be a link. There's no need to add a span class equals icon to that. This also sets us up for something that's even more effective, and that is microformats. Anyone started putting microformats into their applications? Just a very small number of us. I encourage you to look at doing this. If you have data in your application that needs to, at any point, be passed to another application, either your application or someone else's application, I encourage you to use microformats inside of that application. Because all we have to do is with this event, for example, we can do an H calendar microformat. And all that means is we add one extra div. We wrap the entire event in one div. And we say class equals v event, because that's kind of the accepted uh, class name for H calendar in terms of microformats. You can find all of this, by the way, at microformats.org. It's that site that, design, that uh, Dan Cederholm designed, the one that I showed stretching with the Chinese characters and so on. That talks all about microformats and how to use them. But the point being here is all I have to do is, is assign a couple accepted class names, such as summary in the H2, DT start down in my DD of October 15th. Here we're adding back in kind of a useless span element, aren't we? Whereas we were trying to eliminate that before. Well, here we're adding it back in. And you could do this with a strong or an M tag, something that might be a bit more semantic. Here we're introducing that back in in order to assign the class of DT start to that start date. Notice the title. We're using an ISO format of 2007 1015 so that as a machine processes this data, meaning an other application, one of your own applications, you can now have that machine recognize that data and port it out. I could probably spend an entire hour on microformats. Jeremy Keith and, and Tantek Chelik have all spoken about this at length, because there's so much uh, exciting progress and development taking place with microformats. 
And then finally, the map. I could say, okay, that map is location, title, conquered. And I could literally have that event, if I had the, the, the appropriate software installed, and they're already starting to build this into some of the browsers, as I understand, or at least making plans to do so, I could then export those events right into iCalendar, perhaps even into my iPhone and other things of that nature, just by having a few extra classes in the markup that assign, tell a little bit about what the markup is. It's an event, location, and date. Boom, I can then transfer that data from application to application or website to website. All right, and um, finally, improper form markup. I encourage you, if you're not doing so, to use field sets, legends, and labels for your forms. Um, this is almost mandatory for accessibility, but it also facilitates, actually, uh, design. It's easy to use. Here's the Authentic Jobs website where you post a, a listing. It's easy to then take those elements, such as the legend and the labels, and align them to the left, break them out with a box around them or perhaps a border around them, et cetera, et cetera. All right, we've got three minutes, about three minutes left. Some of you came up during the break, and I want to restate what had been said, and now there's like five of you, and I can't remember who came up and spoke with me. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you spoke with me and suggested something over the break. I need to see your face to remember. Bob, I know you mentioned something. Is that Bob? Yeah. Can you state what you had said? Uh Did anyone hear that? He said, the Google guidelines for webmasters state that hiding any text, no matter how you do it, display non, text indent, is, is disencouraged or, or encouraged to not do it, however you want to say that. Um, he said, one workaround might be to use JavaScript that if that item does need to be hidden, that have it display um, as the page renders, but then immediately hide so that it's still somewhere there in the markup. OK, who else spoke with me? Got about one or two minutes left. Go ahead. Right, so we had that problem with the baseline, right, with the Tuscany layout um, navigation where it was now being supported, the important hack by IE, but it was displaying improperly. Your suggestion is to use conditional comments to target whatever IE6 or IE7 specific bugs need to be um, dealt with and put those into their own style sheet. Is that right? Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead. Wait, say that again? Oh, right, right. Rephrase what you had mentioned to me. So in IE6, uh, it's hard to make a div smaller. You know, so eventually you might be able to like a lot of things or whatever. Uh, IE6 always allocates one account you know, as if there's content in it. To make it collapse, uh, you can use a line height to make it collapse vertically or horizontally. Sometimes that's a problem. So if you put a comment inside, IE6 will allow it to collapse. It's kind of Okay, so in order to get a, a, a div and IED to, to collapse all the way to, say, one pixel, you need to specify a line height of one pixel. Line height for the vertical, but for the horizontal, you need to throw a comment or something in there that will cause it to contract. A comment works because it doesn't allocate space. If you have a space mm -hmm. in there, it'll sync off. Okay. We got a time? One more. Anybody else? Somebody else came up with me. Where's the, uh, where's the Canada people that came up and spoke with me? They're gone. They left. I ran them off. <laughs> OK. All right, well, let's go in there. We'll conclude here in about 15 minutes. Thank you again, Cameron. Whoops, hello there. Um, and I just want to remind folks um, about the reception again this evening at the aquarium. Uh, that is from 7 to 9 o'clock. And more specifically, to remind you to bring your badge, because um, you will need your badge to get in. So don't forget your stinking badges. Um, we'll be back in 15 minutes to wrap up with Cameron on this side. And we'll be talking podcasting on the other side.
Can you 